Hey, I got some fresh batteries, and it works a whole lot better with batteries. Uh, once again, did everybody get a copy of the second chance list inside the bulletin for today? Sorry. And also the uh, Mark Pastor's notes and everything else? Okay. And the kids have already gone out? Okay. By the way, if... Um, uh, I had a question earlier about where can I watch the video of the service if I have to work? And the answer is you can either do it on YouTube, you can do it on Westview Christian Center Facebook, you can do it on my personal Facebook, and you can do it most of all on the church app. And on the church app you have, uh, it's Westview Christian Center, there is a Westview Christian Church, so you need to get the right one, there's no charge for downloading the app. And you can get it there. We're trying to get some more things on there to make it more of a communication device so that you can learn what's going on. And uh, then also you can download that on your smartphone. You can either get it on the Google Play Store or you can get it on the iTunes Store. Uh, we don't have it set up for tablets yet. And uh, so you can do that and you can keep track. One of the great things about the app is that it takes and it automatically turns the video and creates a podcast at the same time so if you if you want if you're just able to listen to it um, you can listen to the uh, podcast at the same time it gives you a choice so it's a great thing to have and a great way to communicate in this day and time growing up I never believed we'd be able to do stuff like that okay so I want to talk to you in the third message here about who to love and so that's the title of ours, and so it's part of the series on neighbors, and we're almost done with this series. Next week will be the last one of the series, and then we're going to do a series called Grace. Are we on with the video? Okay. And um, I just wanted to ask because we'd had another a bunch of other events taking place. So in this series already, we have looked at two definitions that I think have carried us all the way through. And one of them is called authentic love, and uh, it's a care and concern for others that comes from a Holy Spirit change and empowered mind, will, and emotions. Mind, will, and emotions is what we actually call the heart or the soul, and it can be used for any one of those. But unless you have the Holy Spirit within, and even to the point of overflowing, you're not going to be able to love authentically. There will always be a measure of yourself caught up in that. The other thing was is that we called it good fruit last week. I changed it and uh, nobody would know in this message why in the world we're talking about fruit. So what I did was I changed it to be just like Jesus. And so that's always what we imitate is Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we are imitating God's goodness and one of the things we did today as we celebrated the Lord's Supper, as we re remembered not only His grace, but His goodness towards us. And so He did it to set us free of the bonds of sin and the ways that that had entangled us and kept us from living the life that God had intended. So today I want to start off by reading a portion of the text, and um, you may already know this one. How many of you know the parable of the story of the Good Samaritan? How many of you know that one? Okay, somebody tell me how it starts. In the beginning. Ah, you didn't expect that, did you? Okay, somebody tell me how, what, tell me the story. Somebody tell me the story. <laughs> no, not you. Somebody else. Anybody, tell me the story. Once upon a time, there was a guy with a bubble home. A Jewish man on the road to Jericho. Okay. Was set upon by robbers. Okay. Left harmed in the middle of the roadway. Okay. A rabbi went across the way to get around him. All righty. Somebody yep. else. What's next? Another priest went by him, didn't it? Okay. And so another priest went by him, and then what happened? Samaritan. 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 Yeah, that's why it's called the Good Samaritan. Okay, so the Samaritan comes along, 
And was the Samaritan a favorable person for the Jews? No. 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 And so whenever Jesus is telling this story, to make a point, because he's been accosted by a Jewish uh, lawyer, a theologian, if you will, or a professor of religious knowledge. So then this guy is trying to ask Jesus the question, okay, how can I inherit, see the word is inherit eternal life. You don't inherit eternal life. Your grandma may have gone to church all of her life. Your grandfather may have gone to church. Your mom, your dad, your uncle, your aunt, your godfather, godmother, whatever. But you never inherit eternal life. Standing in a garage will not turn you into a Cadillac. Okay? So you are going to have to make an individual decision to be able to do it. But in Jewish thinking of the day, he is thinking about, okay, I'm a descendant of Abraham, so now how can I inherit everything that was promised to Abraham? And so the eternal life comes along with it because if we read the Psalms, we'll find out that that's the case. So as I look at this, this Jewish uh, lawyer, this Jewish theologian, religious scholar, is asking a, uh, asking a question. Jesus answers with another question. And then tell, Jesus tells him the story, and then Jesus asks him a question. So this is a very common form of dialogue in first century, especially among Jews. They would talk about a passage, then discuss it, and ask questions, and so forth. And they didn't have Google, so they had to find a way to transfer knowledge from one to the other. So how does the story wind up? Okay, we got the Good Samaritan coming there, and then what happens? Anybody? The Samaritan picks him up, takes him to the hotel, pays the hotel owner to... Takes him to an inn and pays the bills. And then leaves some money and says, whenever I come back, I'll pay whatever charges have racked up. Have you ever tried that at a motel? Walk out and uh, go, hey, uh, my good Samaritan friend's coming along in a few days and he's going to pay for the tab? Uh, no, they'll repossess you. And so we know that that's not the case. But uh, so that we get an accurate picture, a lot of times what we look at, and you can read the story in Luke chapter 10, you can read it for yourself, but we've caught the basic gist of it. And so as we look at this series, we're going to be looking at the question of who do I love? Who is my neighbor? And so a lot of times we have talked about these things in different ways. We thought about the downtrodden in society. We thought about the super wealthy. We thought about the persons next door, back behind us, or somewhere. And I don't think that we really, in our American way of life, have thought about who is our neighbor. So who do I love? And so I thought it would be helpful to see what the road to Jericho actually looked like. So here's what we think of whenever we think of a road. I mean, look at the size of the ditches alongside. I mean, it's incredible. There's two lanes, uh, perfect for a motorcycle ride, but it is phenomenal. If we look up over here, here is a man walking on the actual Jericho Road. And this one went for 17 miles from Jerusalem, which was at 3,000 feet above sea level, and it went all the way down to Jericho, 17 miles away, which is now at uh, just below sea level. So there's quite a change, quite a change in elevation as they go along. Part of it is fairly flat, but there is most of it looks like this. So whenever we talk about the Jericho Road and look at it from a distance, here it is. That's it. There is no road on the other side. So whenever we talk about the guy went over to the other side, and they passed by him. What they did was the rabbi and the priest had to somehow get up on the rocks over here or something to be able to pass this guy who had been set upon by the robbers. Not an easy task. Not an easy task. And so they went out of their way to avoid the guy that had been beaten by robbers. And if we look at this area here, we can find that there are a lot of caves and other places where uh, criminals and so forth could hide and could do their damage. So whenever we think of the Jericho Road, don't think of this. This may be the road to Jericho somewhere, I don't know. But um, 
uh, this, is, this is the Jericho Road. No way of escape. They had to purposely go out of their way to avoid the guy. So the thing that we need to look at is this as we think of this story. You know, here we have two people that were religious professionals. And so what they were doing was they were going out of their way to avoid the responsibility that they were called to. You see, and it's kind of the same way for us. You know, if we go to church every Sunday and we look nice and we act nice, but then we avoid those kind of people that are in difficulties, and we call them victims. And so whenever we look at the victim, we see that what happened to him was not his fault. Well, if he wouldn't have been on the road, if he wouldn't have had money, if he wouldn't have had a donkey, they wouldn't have attacked him. Really? Are you sure? You see, whenever you're in the presence of a criminal element, even in this day and time, a lot of times you don't have to have anything and people will attempt to take advantage of you. I mean, it just happens because we still have wicked people. The victim was set upon because of the wickedness of other people. We have that in today's society. A lot of times it is much more polite. And for instance, there are ways that they will get your bank account numbers. Do not think that some prince in Nigeria really loves you and really wants to send you $2 billion. If only you will send him your bank account number because he won't. What he'll do, if it's a he or a she, is they will drain everything you got. So don't, don't respond to that one. The other one is, I just bought myself a brand new Land Rover and Google is hiring. So all I need to do is sign up for this and I will immediately get my check for $4,000. Don't respond to that one either. Okay? And so what we realize is there are criminals in a lot of different profiles and they're wicked. There's no other way to put it. There's no good intent. There's no good actions. So the man in this parable or in this story is actually helpless. And a lot of us find ourselves in that way also. And so we find that we are helpless to deal with the world's, with the world's issues and difficulties. And so whenever that happens, we need to remember that not only is God our Savior, but that somebody is going to come along and take care of us. And so we don't need to be in that victim status, and largely the way that we avoid it is what's called situational awareness. I just told you that you don't have any contact with anybody in Nigeria, and I just told you that you can't make a lot of money for Google on the Internet. So that's two things. Okay, so now whenever we look at things, we know that there are certain paths of life that really are subject to affliction. We have known people, Emma and I have, that have overindulged themselves in various pharmaceuticals and now they're in bad shape. We know that there are people who have gotten themselves in unwise spending patterns and they are also in bad shape. And so we have all kinds of things, all kinds of ways that people get into bad shape and so we just need to realize that there are certain paths of life that are really subject to affliction. A lot of times they're put upon us by events or something. We have people with a lot of injuries and like back pain and so forth, which was not caused by any inappropriate action on their part. But we just know that the human body can't do a lot of stuff that we think it can do. And sometimes we have what we call birth defects, which there is no defect in a birth, but there are things that come along as a result of birth. And so we watch as we are victims of those type of things that came in with the fall. And the other thing that we need to understand is that for the victim, are we aware of the needs of others? Are we really aware? Do, are we looking around with Holy Spirit eyes to see what is going on, how people need help? And whenever I was younger, people would say, you need help? And I would go, no. Anybody here ever do that? I'm 73, I'll admit I did it and I shouldn't have, okay? And so what we can see is we can see that oftentimes we have in our pride, we have resisted the help. I'll tell you a story. Moved down to the deep south, Pascagoula, Mississippi, from up in southern Colorado where I was used to a lot of Hispanic people talking pidgin Spanish and mixing it up with English and everything. I had a big old beard at the time and they used to call me, they used to call me Jaronimo, and, uh, or they used to call me Cachetón, 
And so at that time, they told me, now I don't know if it's true or not, if you speak Spanish and it's not true, come tell me so I won't tell the story again and embarrass myself. But they used to call me Cachetón. And they said that he was a sidekick of Pancho Villa and that Cachetón meant beaver cheeks. Is that true? You don't know? He's not saying anything. You can, okay, probably not, but that's what they told me. At least they didn't call me Tonto. You know what Tonto means? Dummy. And so we had a guy that worked for us called Amigo Tono. And so they would go, hey, Tono, you know, and I'm going like, who, me? You know, and they would go, no, no, you're, you're the boss. And so you just need to be aware that there are certain things that happen in the culture. And so as we are aware, there then becomes a way that we understand that God's word is going to direct us. So whether it was accurate what they were calling me or not, I still didn't get offended. Okay? I was too busy trying to get a building built. So what we need to do is figure out, okay, what is the Samaritan model of doing this? And so the Samaritan model, is it up there? Did I put it in there? Okay. So the Samaritan model goes like this. Now we realize that Jesus used the Samaritan as a way of tweaking this lawyer because Jews hated Samaritans. They called them half-breeds. And so they were part Jewish, they were part from somewhere else in the kingdom that the king of Assyria had brought in and put there. And so you can read that in the Older Testament. And uh, so the Samaritans thought that they were the chosen people and the Jews knew in their minds that they weren't. And so there was a lot of discussion about that and the hatred and so forth. Next week, actually, we're going to look at John chapter 4, where Jesus is in Samaria and talks to a Samaritan woman at the well. It's a great passage, and uh, uh, Jody Smith one time uh, gave us a talk on that. But it's very interesting to watch because... Here is the model that Jesus is using, and so it's somebody that was not of the same faith as everybody else. So if we go out of here and say something like, I only stop for Westview people. That's not a good one. How about I only stop for Bible believers? That's not a good one. How about if I stop for Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes. How about if I stop for Latter-day Saints? Yes. How about if I stop for a Baptist? Well, that one's kind of in doubt. But anyway, uh, you know, the answer is yes. And so we need to understand that it's not by your religious affiliation that you are actually called to minister grace and love to somebody else. It's because of who you are in Christ, what your identity is, then you get to bring the love of Christ to somebody else no matter who they are. And so here in this area, we have a lot of challenges. That's why to me, uh, the Interface Sewing Day is a big deal because we get to get in there and mix with people from other faiths. There may even be Lutherans there or Presbyterians, uh, Methodists. There'll be all kinds of different people there and people from the community. And so this is a great opportunity for us to love them. Okay. So also, too, not only was the Samaritan a guy of, uh, not only was this, what I see, a guy of uh, uh, different faith, but he was somebody that could not repay. So if you're always there and you are ready to, to help somebody, if you think that they can replay, repay, you know, if you're looking and they got Gucci loafers on and they're uh, dressed in Armani clothes or whatever, and uh, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up on Google. So uh, whenever we look at somebody, oftentimes we address that because of their ethnicity, their cultural, or their possessions. I told you the story last week about how the most uh, hostility that I ever experienced was because I showed up in elk hunting camp with a 30 6 and everybody else had the latest Magnum uh, rifles, you know, and here I was with this thing that had come out in 1906, and why was I still doing, using something as weak as that? So we sort out things oftentimes based on appearances or on our, our intuition that they cannot repay. And that's never the goal because Jesus came and gave his life for us and he knew that we could not repay. And that's a picture of grace itself. 
he came and sh sh uh, shed his blood because he knew that we could not repay. And so this guy also, he was rejected by his own people. And sometimes we find that people that are on the outer edge of everything, they can't repay, they get rejected, and maybe there's something in their story that, uh, that keeps them from receiving the help that they should receive. And so he was helped, however, by the Samaritan, the guy the victim was, he was helped without any hesitations. The two religious persons that Jesus used in the story went to great effect to go around this guy. I mean, there he is laying on the road. And so we saw how wide the road is. It was barely a, a yard wide, much less two lanes. And there he is laying there. So sometimes whenever we think about, am I going to help somebody? Do we realize that this is an opportunity for us to be able to give God's grace to somebody else? And so that's the challenge for us, is not to look and to judge, but for us to do with the work that Christ has called us to. And sometimes it even involves us so that we have to change our minds about what we're watching, what we're witnessing, and so <coughs> forth. So I want to tell you, I want to read you a story a uh, young lady, you can put the picture up. This is uh, Teresa and Keith Gunter. And we had the privilege, we had the privilege of mentoring Teresa for a couple of years when we were in Mobile, Alabama. Just a beautiful lady and a real sweetheart. And her husband, Keith, is really a God-loving guy. But I want to read you Teresa's story. She put it on Facebook, and I asked if I could uh, use it, and she said, most certainly. So here we go. This is Teresa's story, not Jerry's. Keith stopped at an auto supply store the other night after work. I felt uncomfortable, but I stayed in the car. When Keith came out of the store, a man approached him asking for money for gas. God forgive me, but I thought he just wanted money for drugs or alcohol. Keith walked with him to the nearby gas station and bought him $10 worth of gas. It turns out he really did need help. He was a day laborer in Mobile, Alabama, and when he got off work, he put his key in his car door and it broke off. Anybody ever have that happen? Or how about you lost your key and it fell down in a storm drain? Something like that? Okay, so this guy called the locksmith to unlock his car and make him a new key. This cost him his gas money to get back home in Pascagoula, which is about 45 miles to the west. Teresa says, I repented. That is phenomenal. I repented. I would want someone to help a family member or a friend of mine. God placed Keith in the right place at the right time. You see what happened here? Here was somebody that Keith, who is a successful car salesman, uh, there at a Honda place there in Mobile by the Bel Air Mall, Keith actually went out of his way to be able to help this guy Teresa had the feelings of, oh no, we're vulnerable, and other things. And Teresa is just the sweetest thing in the world. I hope someday that you guys get to meet her. We'll have to have Keith and Teresa come out, and she's just, she's just absolutely the sweetest thing, and he's the greatest guy. I was so happy to see the two of them whenever they decided to get married. And uh, so we need to understand that she, what she's going through here is something very normal for us. She's watching her husband go out there and involve himself in the life of somebody else. And she doesn't think that the person is worthy of being helped. And then as she takes him over, and then here's the story later, she realizes that she has to repent. And so whenever we think about repent, we need to understand that repent is whenever I change my way of thinking 180 degrees from where it was. You see, in a circle, just like your watch, there is 360 degrees. So whenever we say repent, that means that from the big hand being on the 12, now the big hand is going to be on the 6, and I'm heading in that direction. So whenever we talk about that, we realize here that Teresa was sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit that she realized that her way of thinking was wrong and she changed right then and there. And so then comes the joy of realizing 
that her husband Keith, who is a great guy himself, is now helping somebody else, and she thought that they were not worthy of being helped. So that's one of the things that needs to happen with us, is we need to be of the mind that I'm going to help regardless of what the circumstances look like. I'm not going to be stupid. I'm going to be situationally aware of what's going on. But if I see somebody that's going to need help, I'm going to at least inquire and say, do you need help? And while I'm asking that, I'm going to be looking for obviously blood and gore and everything else and then be prepared to help in some way. I'm not an EMT, but God will give me the guidance to be able to help somebody. I was building a big uh, prison in Pensacola, Florida and doing large construction. And uh, in the radios, you know, we had radios. I was in my job trailer. And uh, so all of a sudden, I got the word on the, on the, uh, on the radio that a whole stack of uh, heavy-duty shoring had fallen down on, on one old man that was working for us. He was a great carpenter. And so he was working for us. So instead of going, uh, well, why don't you just call 911 and see, let me know when they show up. Instead of that, my immediate reaction was, and would probably be yours too, is to rush immediately to the scene and see what we could do. And so the only thing that we could do, because he was up on the fourth floor, and there was no elevator there at that time going up and down, so what we had to do was get this guy down, because obviously this heavy-duty shoring had fallen on him, and it caused him great injury and pain. So the thing that we did was we immediately, I, I told the crane operator, I said, get a trash box, fly it up over here, and so he did. So they flew a trash box up there, and we put the gentleman in the trash box, and then I rode down in the trash box with him. And so if you've never had a rapid descent in a, in a 300 ton crane, and flying down to get this guy to the ambulance, then you have never had an experience. No e-ticket ride. How many of you know what an e-ticket ride is? A few of you? Okay. Um, you're old. You're all old. And uh, so, so I rode down with him, and we got down on the ground uh, just in time to be able to meet the ambulance and got him in it. But you see, instantaneous response is oftentimes what we need to do because other people don't have the Holy Spirit within to tell them what to do, and we need to do it. Now, a lot of times there are people that you can tell by the Holy Spirit that are going to make you vulnerable, and so you want to be careful how you do this. But by the same token, you want to be willing and then have God give you the safeguards that are going to be there. So the whole thing about, and it comes down to, am I ready? Am I willing? Can I do it? And the answer is yes. And so sometimes whenever we look at people in unfortunate circumstances or more difficult things, the thing that we need to do is we need to be ready. We need to be ready to save them and serve them from the circumstances that they're in. Does that make sense? Um, so whenever we see people here in town, some of them we will know, some of them we won't know. And so we need to be ready to love not only those that we do know, but we need to be ready to love those that we don't know. If you know how to help somebody and you don't do it, then you're not living the Christ-like life. Because the Bible says that God, while we were still sinners, that means a rebel and hating God, sent his son to reconcile us back to the Father. And so that's what he did. That's what we celebrated today in the Lord's Supper was that reconciliation is possible uh, through him and through the sacrifice. It doesn't mean that you're a church member. What it means is that if you acknowledge him as Savior and Lord, you're a member of God's family, so we need to do what Jesus did and be imitators of him. Okay, I've got some definitions for you, and we're going to run over these, and then i got, I got a handout for you. So let's take a look at these. I added a new one here on the bottom. So let's go from the bottom. Love without judging. Is that easy or hard? hard? It's hard. It's hard. Because if I look at you and listen to you, I will make it that will make an impression on me and I will choose to love you or not love you based on that which is unbiblical. Okay? We need to love without judging. Okay? 
Jesus didn't say, you guys are too far gone for me. I'm not going to, you know, you're not, I'm not going to pay the price for you. No, he said, whosoever will may come. And so it's a different thing that we usually experience. Like I said, we usually uh, judge somebody, and it's okay to judge, but just be aware that the standard by which you judge, you're going to be judged. So if you're really harsh, you're going to get judged harshly. It may be in this life or the one to come. But anyway, life without judging. That means that I am on the alert for those that God has placed in my path to love on his behalf because the Holy Spirit dwells in me. Now this one really plays out whenever you're in town or whenever you're at work or whenever you're shopping, whenever you're doing whatever, because here are all these people that you're running into. And so especially whenever you see not just the elderly, but whenever you see the young ones with their children, that is often the time whenever you need to exercise the love and you just need to say, that's a sweet child. Even though it's yelling and making a fit, just make the mom feel good, okay? And the next thing is, the next thing up above that is I need to be just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. Jesus touched lepers. That was a no-no in his day and time. Big no-no. See, the leper was supposed to be outside of town, and he was supposed to announce that he was coming. And he was supposed to say, he was supposed to say, I am unclean, I am unclean, and then everybody could avoid him. Well, see, Jesus went right up to him and touched him and prayed for him and healed him. So in a certain sense, we have no right, we have no right to avoid those that may, may be of lesser means or more difficult circumstances than we are. I was reading a thing the other night about rednecks, and we all go, ooh, rednecks. You know, well, I happen to know a lot of them, and I love them. And some of them were my best friends whenever I was living in the South. I haven't met very many rednecks here, uh, even though we should have, you know. But uh, we need to understand that we can't categorize people because God doesn't. He puts them in two categories. He goes, member of the family, not a member of the family, but I want him to be in the family. So that's our, that's our criteria for judging who will help. Okay, authentic love. That's the care and the concern for others that comes from the, having the Holy Spirit within us. That care and concern has to be there if we are going to be truly called members of Christ's family. And so that's very important. And last time what we did was we put up the chart that compared what it looked like B.C. and what it looked like A.D. And so we saw that the deeds that come from not knowing Christ were horrendous to contemplate whenever we see them working out in our life. But the deeds that we call the fruit of the Spirit, they are good. You need to have them. You're imitating God if you're working towards having those. Okay, my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Well, it's not just the people across the street or the people alongside. It's anybody that you come in contact with or you even think about. If you are thinking about somebody in the past couple of weeks, we've had you fill out a little form, and you can keep it for yourself, and we're going to do it again today here in a moment. And so we're going to do it with a little twist today. And so what it means is that it's any human that you're in contact with. It doesn't matter, matter whether it's on Facebook be nice on Facebook, by the way. If you're on Instagram, be nice. If you're on Twitter, please be nice. And don't be offending others by your words. You know, keep your opinions to yourself. Okay? And a believer or a disciple. You see, we talked about people being called Christians, and they're only called Christians a couple of times in the Newer Testament. We have adopted that label, but back then at the beginning, that was not a nice thing to be called. Oh, you're one of those Christians. And uh, so instead, what we say now is we are disciples, okay? So we are believers. We are disciples. That means I am a learner. That means that I'm constantly loving. So what I want you to do today is, uh, if you got the concept, we all got the concept, right? So if you got the concept, I want you to take out this little form, and I'm calling this second chance list. Okay, second chance list. So many of you, many of you put names down on the first two lists. And so I want you to think a moment. Think about it this way. Who 
that you walked by this past week that you want another chance to love? Who did you walk by, like a rabbi or a Levite, who did you walk by that you want to have another chance to love? It may be a smaller list than what you had before, and that's perfectly understandable. But I want us to reflect a little bit and see who did I walk by this past week that I want to have another chance to love them. Who? You have to put a name down. Not, don't put down the whole world. Don't put down, put down somebody's name. Yeah, Pastor Jerry. You put Pastor Jerry down there. And... Uh, <clears throat> You can even put Rebecca Niederhauser down there because I'm going to have to have a second chance to love her after she got off for me at the beginning of the year. So. Some of you missed the vibrancy of friendship. You did. You really did. Okay? Who? How about the judges at the gymnastic team? You need to have another chance to love them, or you have to with the scores. They were good. They were good. They were good. <laughs> this is a great opportunity to think. I'm going to think. Who do I need? Who do I need to have a second chance at? Because I'm living according to these definitions. It's a different challenge, isn't it? See, mostly we just say, go, be warm, be fed, and be on your way. And now what we're doing is we're saying, whoa, God, I may have missed somebody this past week, and I need another chance to go and to love them. I'm not going to go up to them and say, hey, I avoided you last week because I just didn't want to deal with your issues. You don't say that. You just go, hi, how are you? You're the one that knows that you missed the chance. They don't know it. But now you're going to have the primary opportunity to go and say, Denise, I missed a chance to say hi last week. And I apologize. I request your forgiveness. And so that's what we do. We just go ahead and we get to have a do-over. And sometimes God gives us do-overs. A lot of times he doesn't. And then we go, God, I'm, I'm, I request your forgiveness because I could have loved him. And I didn't. See, and it doesn't take a massive amount of stuff. It doesn't say, say oh, Denise, I missed a chance to wax your car. You know, no, what it, I did, didn't I? Uh, okay, so what it, So, and I didn't even wash my own truck, so there's no excuse. So what we need to do is just say, I missed a chance to just say a friendly word. Hi, how are you? Are you doing okay? I just missed the chance. I'm really glad I saw you. And so whenever we miss those chances, that's a second chance that we need to do. You may not have it. Whoever gave you the examination in inorganic chemistry may be the one, maybe not. Or was it organic chemistry? Was it organic? Organic. Okay. I never took that one. I wasn't smart enough to do that, but Andrea does. And so we just need to realize that there are people that we have walked by and sometimes even avoided. Have you ever gone to the market and seen somebody that never treated you good and you go the other way, they're going over to the left, you're going over to the right, but you know what God does? You're both going to meet at the meat counter. M-E-E-T counter. Okay? So you just need to be more open and understand what he is. Okay, now, because we're talking about loving our neighbors, I want you all to stand. And we're going to do what we did before, and I want you to turn somebody, turn to somebody, and I want you to tell them what the challenges have been in this past week. So go ahead and move around.